I'm Ashley Rooney from Lexington Remembers World War II Committee. I'm so glad you're with us. Today, we're going to talk about Julian Buskang. He had a very interesting life. Julian and Faye Buskang lived in Lexington from 1962 to 2009. They lived for 20 years on Peacock Farm Road and for 27 years in the center on Forest Street. Their three children, Jessica, Julie, and Jeffrey, went through Bowman School, then Clark Junior High, as it was known then, and finally the high school. Faye was active in PTA, Replace, and the Guidance Advisory Committee. And Julian was active in town meeting and on various committees and served on the Hanscom Field Task Force Committee. They were longtime members of Temple Isaiah. They loved Lexington and found it a wonderful place to bring up children. Life was good. But life wasn't always that way. Julian, his parents and sister left Poland in 1939. As he says in the book, We Shall Not Forget, published by Temple Isaiah, he has had a fulfilling life, but the Holocaust still affects him. He tells us about that life in the following recording made earlier this year at Newbridge on the Charles in Dedham, Massachusetts, his current residence. Today it's my pleasure to tell you about my experiences before, during, and after the war. I will include a little history as well of my personal experiences. I was born in Poland in 1925. When World War II broke out on September 1, 1939, I was 14 years old. Today, 81 years later, I am 95. Thus, I consider myself one of the last eyewitnesses of these historic times. Poland is a place that experienced many border changes over the years. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was once one of the largest countries in Europe, but later it was carved up, partitioned, and occupied by its neighbors, Russia, Germany, and Austria-Hungary, so that Poland as an independent country was wiped off the map of Europe. This slide shows the divided Poland in 1815. The central part is green, and was called the Congress Kingdom of Poland, but was governed by Russia. The part in yellow became included in Russia and was known as the Pale of Settlement. My native city Lwów became part of Austria-Hungary, the part in blue. Its name in German was Lemberg and it was the capital of the Austrian province called Galicia. After World War I, Poland was reconstituted as an independent country. And for about 20 years, from 1918 to 1939, Lwów became again an integral part of Poland. It was the third largest city of Poland after Warsaw, the capital, and Lodz, Łódź, the center of the textile industry. When I was growing up, the population of Lwów was 340,000 and it was quite diverse. Only a little more than half the inhabitants were Polish Catholics. A third were Jews and the rest were mostly Ukrainians and some Armenians. 
my family were my parents, my older sister and myself. I had many other relatives living nearby. My father was a successful businessman and we were financially quite secure. We were assimilated, well-to-do Jewish family, and my parents spoke Polish at home, not Yiddish. We lived in a nice three-story house owned by my parents. Our family lived on the middle floor. My father's business office was on the ground floor and an Austrian tenant lived on most of the top floor. We belonged to the so-called Great Synagogue of the City, one of the few in Poland called Progressive, which is similar to Conservative US, in US. We were not kosher or very religious, but definitely Jewish. A year before the war, at age 13, I had my bar mitzvah and I became an adult. Little did I know that what was going to happen a year later. The country next to Poland on the west was Germany. Hitler came to power in 1933 and began his Nazi campaign against Jews, asserting the religious superiority of the Germans because many of them were blonde-haired and blue-eyed and called Aryan. Germany was then struggling economically and Hitler claimed that the, his people would be better off if Jews and other non-Aryans were eliminated. A strange concept how to overcome an economic crisis but the majority of German people accepted it. The Nazi campaign against Jews spread gradually to Poland. In the few years before World War II started, Poland experienced a gradual rise of antisemitism. Many young Polish Catholic university students formed a party called the National Democratic Party, ND or Endesia. The number of Jewish students admitted to universities became limited. Jewish students were often not allowed to sit on the front benches and sometimes forced to stand up at the back of the classroom. Occasionally, the National Democratic students would beat up Jews on the street. Thus, before the war began, my parents began to discuss that when I graduated high school, I should study abroad. World War II began on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. The school year was just about to begin. Within the first few days, German aircraft bombed our city. People were not allowed to go out at night. All windows had to be covered with blankets or other material 
so that no light would shine through the window that might make our homes a target for bombs. We had to tape up the windows so that the vibrations of bomb explosions would not shatter the glass into the room or onto the street. We were asked to create bomb shelters in our basements. We stored food and water supplies there. When the air raid sirens sounded, we would run downstairs to the basement and sit there till the air raid was over. In one of the raids, a bomb destroyed the house of my Aunt Clara. In just a few days, we learned that the German army was advancing and the Polish army retreating. A few of our relatives from Krakow escaped east to avoid the German occupation. They arrived in Lwów seeking shelter and some of them stayed in our house. My parents began to discuss whether we should flee the city. My father consulted our, the Austrian man who was our tenant and friend. He advised us to leave the city as soon as possible. My father purchased a car to be able to flee, but our car was soon requisitioned by the Polish army. My aunt and uncle had also decided to escape and they agreed to take us with them. Their car was also requisitioned, but lucky for us, my uncle had some influence and got permission to keep his car for a few more days. And that was long enough for us to get out of the city. He had to agree that the driver would bring the car back in a few days to give it to the military. Cars were new then, so few people knew how to drive. Neither my father nor my uncle could drive. So having a driver was critical. We were not the only ones trying to flee. Many people were escaping from their homes in every direction. The roads were crowded with people traveling on foot or by horse-drawn horse wagons. Very few cars in those days. At one point, German airplanes Stuka drive bombers appeared overhead, strafing the roads. We had to go out of the car and crouch in the dish till the danger passed. Most people were traveling east towards the long border with the Soviet Union but my family decided to go south towards the narrow border Poland had with Romania. This turned out to be very fortunate. Many of those who went east ended up in Siberia. When we reached a town near the Romanian border, we encountered a long line of official vehicles. It was the Polish government evacuating. We decided to follow. We did not have a visa which was necessary to cross to Romania. However, when nightfall came, 
my father bribed a border guard and we were allowed to cross on foot to Romania. We carried just a few small suitcases and knapsacks on our backs. Many Americans don't realize that a few days after Poland was attacked from the West, the Soviets entered Poland from the East under a secret agreement with the Germans. On September 17, Soviet troops marched in to occupy eastern half of Poland. It was fortunate that we left Poland when we did. Stalin, the Soviet dictator, proceeded to deport about one and a half million Poles from the Soviet occupied part of Poland, particularly those who were military, businessmen, or government officials. Most of them were sent to Siberia, slave labor camps, or collective farms. Families were often divided. As for my family, after we crossed the border, we took the train to Bucharest, the capital of Romania. Bucharest was full of Polish refugees. We settled in one room in the cheapest hotel we could find. To save money, we cooked simple meals on a hot plate. I first attended a French school for the boys. Later, a Polish refugee school was formed and I transferred to it. My classmates were all refugees, mostly non-Jewish children of evacuated Polish government officials. Romania, however, was gradually falling under German influence. Polish refugees were running from consulate to consulate, seeking visas to get out of Romania. Visas to Palestine, then under British mandate, were very hard to come by. However, when leaving Poland, my father carried with him a few bars of gold, and they were just enough to qualify us for a special visa called the capitalist visa. We managed to get from Bucharest to Constanza, the Romanian port city on the Black Sea and traveled by ship to the Mediterranean and then to Haifa. Later, we moved to Tel Aviv, where my sister and I attended a Polish high school along with other Polish refugees, non-Jewish and Jewish. Most of them had been evacuated later from Romania to Palestine by the British. I also began to study English. In June 1941, after we were already in Palestine, Germany unexpectedly turned against its former ally and attacked the Soviet Union. Stalin then asked the British for help with weapons and equipment. As part of the agreement with the British, Stalin released most Polish deportees, allowing them to leave Siberia and form an army to help fight the Germans. General Anders, a Polish general 
who had previously been imprisoned by the Soviets, became the commander of this army, which was officially named the Polish Second Corps, but popularly was called the Anders Army. By an agreement with the British, Stalin allowed the Poles, who had been in forced labor camps and on starvation diet, to gradually recover. Then they trained as the soldiers and got ready to fight. A few months later, Stalin allowed the newly formed Polish army to leave the Soviet Union and proceed to the Middle East through Iran and Iraq to Palestine to help the British army in Egypt. When the Anders army arrived from USSR to Palestine, those of us who graduated from the Polish high school in Tel Aviv volunteered to join. Thus, in 1943, at age 18, instead of going to college, I enlisted in the Free Polish Army, which became a part of the British Eighth Army. By then, we had heard reports of the German atrocities in Poland, particularly against Jews. Some of my family were affected. Thus, I was determined to go and fight to defeat Hitler and his cohorts and end the Nazi terror. When I became a soldier, I was first sent to the desert in Egypt to train with tanks. In later years, when people complained about my driving, I explained that I learned to drive a tank before I learned to drive a car. When my training with camps was finished, I was sent to the wartime Polish officers artillery school in Gedera, Palestine. When I graduated, I was assigned to a light anti-aircraft artillery unit and sent to Italy, where we fought in several bloody battles, including the Battle of Monte Cassino. The Battle of Monte Cassino was the biggest battle of the Anders Army. The mountain was so steep that trucks could not pull heavy equipment up the hill. Thus, at Casino, we became infantry. We had to climb rock by rock on foot. After a week-long battle, we broke the German defense line. This allowed American troops that had landed at Anzio and became surrounded to break through and march into Rome. After Casino, our army was sent back to the Adriatic coast to fight first at Ancona and then at Bologna. When Germany was defeated, we were relieved. Here I am with a Jewish colleague, my friend from the Polish high school in Tel Aviv, both of us smiling. Because I knew English, I was sent to Northern Italy to help the British sort out former concentration camp prisoners and forced labor camp victims who had been liberated from various locations in Europe. I saw with my own eyes 
the emaciated former prisoners of the Germans, many just skin and bones who had barely survived. I also saw the detained German soldiers, now miserable military prisoners, no longer the warlords. We, the Polish soldiers, learned with great dismay that Churchill and Roosevelt allowed Stalin to absorb Eastern Poland in pink, where most of us came from. Lvov became Lviv in Ukraine. In exchange, some of Eastern Germany, party in yellow, was given to the new Poland. When the war was over, General Anders arranged for the qualified Polish soldiers to attend Italian universities. Thus, I began my engineering studies at the Polytechnic in Torino, Italy. Later, we were given choice of going back to Poland or going to England. By then, Poland had fallen under communist control. Very few of us wanted to go back, since our hometowns were controlled by the Soviets. Therefore, most of us chose to go to England. There, I was able to continue my study at the Woolwich Polytechnic preparing for an external student's Bachelor of Science degree from the University of London in Electrical Engineering, and which I received in 1950. Once we knew that Poland had fallen under communist control, my parents and I applied for visas to the United States. Under U.S. quota system, we had to wait for five years. In 1949, our U.S. visas finally arrived. My parents and my sisters, my sister went to New York and I soon followed. My father didn't know much English, having been a successful businessman in Poland. He now delivered photos and sold newspapers in a kiosk. My mother, who in Poland had a maid and a cook, became a seamstress and worked as a peace worker, sewing ties. Still, they never complained. They were happy that we were alive. Before leaving Poland, a friend in America recommended that I apply to MIT to continue studying engineering. I was notified that I was admitted not long after I arrived in New York. Jewish Family Service in New York asked a kind man to lend me a little money. Thus, I was able to go from New York to Boston. I still didn't have enough money, but fortunately I got a part-time job as a laboratory technician under Professor Jerry Wiesner and the MIT Research Laboratory for Electronics. What was particularly helpful was that I also worked as a busboy in the graduate house cafeteria and got free meals. The MIT graduate house became my new home. For my master's thesis at MIT, I discovered a remarkable theorem 
known today as the Boskang theorem, which is useful in signal processing. After I received my master's degree, I went to work at MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which was then located on the MIT campus. After a while, I enrolled as a student at Harvard for the PhD. Insofar as possible, I scheduled my classes at lunchtime or on Saturdays so that I can, could continue working. After I received my PhD from Harvard in 1955, I was offered several academic teaching positions, but I needed money not only to support myself, but also to help my parents. Therefore, I chose to go into industry. I took a job with RCA, a large company that had just opened a new aerospace division in Waltham. I was gradually promoted to become manager of applied research. In 1962, after I was married, I left RCA to establish my own company. <laughs> I started as an individual consultant, but gradually hired additional employees one at a time. In the end, we had over a hundred employees and a nice building in Lexington. We worked on interesting projects, including consulting, on the design of radars for the lunar excursion modules, LEM, for man's first trip to the moon. We also pioneered scanning with phased arrays and in designing modems for digital communications over the horizon. In 1984, my company, Signatron in Lexington, was acquired by Sandstrom Corporation. I was asked to stay three more years and then retired in 1987. At the same time, while I was building the company, Faye and I were raising our three children who are now all grown up with their own families. I was also active in the large professional society, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineering, and became chairman of the Boston section. In 1989, when I was already retired and communism in Poland was waning, we decided to take our three children, then in their 20s, to Poland and Wolf. This was the first time after 50 years that I got to see my childhood home. After that, Faye and I took many more trips to Poland. I became a volunteer with the American International Executive Service Corps, IESC, which was helping the Polish industry privatize. We spent three months in Warsaw in 1993, and in 1994, and six weeks in Krakow in 1995. During those trips, we got involved with the small Jewish community in Poland, 
and revival of Jewish life. We became experts in Polish Jewish genealogical research and gave talks and wrote articles. We made friends and found distant relatives and we kept returning 15 trips in all. One of my favorite trips to Poland included going to Ukraine and took place in 2008 when we returned to Lwów with our children and grandchildren. I was able to show them my house and my elementary school. I also had a second bar mitzvah at age 83 in the same city as my first bar mitzvah, this time surrounded by our children and grandchildren. This slide is the memorial to the Jews of Lvov, now Ukraine, erected by some former residents after the war. In conclusion, the word Holocaust has come to mean the mass murder of six million Jews, about three million of them in Poland alone. Many Jews were first herded into ghettos and then put into concentration camps where most of them died of malnutrition or were killed. There were few survivors. We were very lucky, my immediate family and I, to escape this fate by fleeing Poland. However, what I did experience was dislocation, loss of home, and loss of many of my extended family and friends. I was a refugee without home for 10 years during and after the war. The war may have been over, but my childhood world was eradicated. Most of my family and friends who had stayed behind were dead. We lost most of our property. My family had changed from being well-to-do to being poor. I became a displaced person without a country. However, I worked hard and was able to rebuild my life. Thank you for watching us today. And be sure to go on Lex Remembers on the World War II page. There's an awful lot there. Many wonderful stories and memories that we'll all enjoy.